Jason, should I unbolt it? We have a countdown on our natural reefs at the moment. Scientists are predicting that in, in 50 years we would have lost uh, almost 70% of our natural reefs, which is quite a heavy statistic. I kind of want to set in stone how we knew this was going to happen, so that in 50 years' time, when people look back and say, they knew, why did they not do anything? Why did they not take action? I want it to be immortalised there in stone that we knew this was going to happen, then we were responsible. One good way to cultivate a curious young mind is to offer up a meaningful playground. Lucky is the child born to parents that understand this. Jason DeCarries Taylor was one such child, transported from the chilly shores of England to an island in Southeast Asia where a coral reef awaited him. The young artist was free to explore, and the language shared between creatures became second nature to him. This boy's job was to collect memories. The man would figure out what to do with them later. But with later, still years from anything he could consciously imagine, Jason picked up the scent of graffiti, which fueled his interest in art, and he was off. After four years of art college, followed by a diving stint in Australia, Jason was back in England to work and to make his own creations on the side. But he missed the sea. It was time again to move on. He was looking around the island to investigate where he was going to put his sculptures, and at the same time he was teaching diving. So he taught a lot of my friends how to dive. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> You're still a big baby, really, aren't you? Hey? Then Hurricane Ivan hit the island with a vengeance and destroyed the bay as they'd known it. In its aftermath, Jason conceived of an idea to place sculptures on the sea floor in an underwater park for tourists. This would offer the reefs undisturbed time to replenish and a place for tourists to visit. His idea was well received, and for Jason, things were starting to make sense. Some of the things that nature creates are so beautiful that I could never ever, no human could ever replicate that.
In the past, when I used to make my installations in London, I always became disillusioned that I was creating more mass to add to this planet. When I thought about the idea of the sculptures actually having a twofold purpose, that A, they you know, explored the sort of uh, artistic nature of being underwater, but they had a functional side where they create an artificial reef. I just thought it was a great way to fulfill two things at the same time. Dr. Jaime Gonzalez Cano oversees El Parque Nacional, the national marine park that spans 5,000 square miles between Cancun and a small island eight miles off its coast called Isla Mujeres. Annually, the park receives over 850,000 tourists who visit the Mesoamerican Barrier Reef, the world's second largest, extending from the tip of the Yucatan all the way down to the islands of Honduras. Jaime's concern is the toll tourists are taking on the reefs and how to divert them away, at least in part. If we want the people in the future to see the natural formations, we really need to keep them alive because otherwise we will have nothing to show our grandchildren in the future. Jaime's first attempt was to implement an artificial reef technology called reef balls. But if there was any hope of attracting tourists to the site, Jaime needed a buy-in from Roberto Diaz, general manager at Aquaworld, the area's leading marine tour company. Jaime Gonzalez Cano contacted me as the president of the Nautical Association at the time. He asked me if I could visit the reef ball park that he built. Uh, it's a, it's a, an area very close to Isla Mujeres with more than 100 uh, reef balls have balls with some holes in there and some fish and uh, corals inserted. But I didn't find any beauty in there. And he got frustrated because uh, we didn't want to take tourists there instead of the natural reefs. He said well, that the other option was to shut down by force the natural reefs. And I believe that's a mistake. And I told him that if he do that, I just would sue him. Todd Barber from the Reef Ball Foundation suggested Jaime check out the work of an eco-sculptor from England. I saw the work of Jason Taylor in the computer, and almost before finishing seeing his work, I started to write to him. I explained him the need of having an underwater museum in this national park. The silent evolution, 400 statues strong, deployed to a depth of eight meters. This is such a wonderful marine park to work in because it has a structure, it has ranges, it has uh, all these wonderful protected reefs and has a lot of visitors. So for me, it was also a good opportunity to display my work in. Jason produces this work in a small fishing town just 20 minutes down the coast from Cancun. Well, obviously, this type of work is quite different from normal art projects because the main objective of it is about conservation, making an artificial reef, increasing the biomass underwater, creating habitat areas, aggregating fish. But most importantly, in a high tourist destination like this, it's more about taking people away from the natural resources and providing them with an alternative. Wow. Long hair. <laughs> Good. 
Linda. Claro, para poder pegar esto. ¿Cómo, how, how, how can, ¿Cómo pude hacer eso? How can I do this? I like to see the finish. You have to go diving or snorkeling. Are you going to oh, go? Yeah. Please. <laughs> <laughs> do you snorkel? No, but I learn. So she's keeping the hands, holding the hands, but not with the way of the arms. Uh -huh. The arms, I feel, when this pose is straight, the arms are in the same. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so no, you cannot. It doesn't matter the back. Maybe back is nicer. Come. I don't think I have to be here. More like here. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, that looks nice, and the arch is really nice, you know? Can I put some more ice in the water, just in case we need some more? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
had it once, someone, we were doing a standing mould and uh, all the plaster dripped down the body as we were doing it and we did a really thick mould and all the plaster dripped and there's a big chunk of plaster on the feet that couldn't get out and so I was chipping away the, the plaster. This is too. That's not me. Ah, oh, you changed your ringtone to the same as mine. <laughs> Hey baby, hi Salvi. <laughs> anyway, I, we, we cut the guy, we were trying to chisel away the thing, or the plaster, and it all turned red, and I chiseled into his foot. <laughs> and he couldn't say anything because he was in the cast. She meditating? What? She meditating? No, no she, I think she. <laughs> move, move, move. Ah, okay. No, that's looking good. Okay, ready? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good puzzle, good puzzle. I'm okay. 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 We'll bring her forward more because she's going to fall, so there's not much gravity on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Watch her, go forward because she's arching her back incredibly. Go forward. Go forward. Uh-huh. Sinotes. Entrance into a mysterious world of underground caves and rivers that connect 130 miles of the Yucatan's sole source of fresh water. While the plaster mold of the angel dries, the artists stay busy with 200 additional statues contracted for deployment by year's end. One of these has 10 statues, oh. so it's 20 of these that make 200. And they will go just like, like as an expansion of the already deployed Silent Revolution. All the sculptures are made from a pH neutral marine called ceramic cement and it has a surface area which mimics the same qualities as natural rock and that's what corals like to adhere to to grow. So that's taken quite a bit of time to perfect that technique. Corals are colonies of hundreds of thousands of little polyps that keep reproducing. The hard corals, the ones that produce calcium skeletons, they take a very long time to grow five to a hundred years to really get established. And so the, the sculptures obviously help them by giving them a structure to fix onto. So Rodrigo, how old are you? I'm 30 now. What? 30 years. No. Yeah. March 3, 1981. I look so young, but I'm actually like a dinosaur. <laughs> so, Rodrigo, tell me about what the environmental aspect of this work means to you. I think it's like the most important thing going on in this whole artistic project. 
Not lots of museums are involved in ecology and environmental issues. I definitely believe that this is like contemporary anthropology because we don't know if we're going to make it for 100 years more. So if in any case there's like people trying to find what used to be our, the latest archaeological places, I think that this museum is going to become one of those. Having a, a record about how people are dressing, or how people are evolutionating and evolving between each other, it's going to help to, to define that in the future. All the pieces about evolution and defining how we all live in a constant state of flux. I expect them all to change. I don't ever see them as finished works of art. People say, oh, are you pleased now this is done? And it kind of doesn't really work like that. It's such a ongoing process and really when I put them in the sea that's just the, the beginning of the process. The rest of the sculptures left to the environment to do the finishing work. Jason, he has his regular artists that are from Mexico and it's kind of the first time that we've started taking on international artists. They had a symposium recently, rather artists, but it's the first time that we've taken on employed or volunteers from other countries. Each artist's image has been immortalized and taken its place in the silent evolution, just like the others that have come before. Today, it's Jess's turn. Her statue is cracked open, and the silicon mold is peeled back, revealing it for the first time. silicon mold. After working a while here with Jason, he allowed us to make a piece of art. I think nowadays humankind needs a lot of decoration, gadgets, technology to get astonished by stuff. So we should see a, a tree or a reef or a fish and that should be enough for us to be having a breath of hope and beauty. I think us as human beings could learn from the fishes that they are going to get along in this big uh, map, which is the same as ours. Each, every one of us is given a lot of our, our life or our time and, and our sweat every day just to keep this big installation going on. The silent evolution may be Musa's largest installation to date, but even deeper messages are revealed to those that choose to discover solo gems found throughout the galleries in unexpected places. The figure in the Dream Collector is actually my father, and he's meant to be organizing this archive of glass bottles. Jason has collected messages from people around the world contained inside these bottles, a sort of time capsule of our thoughts and feelings at this moment. 
one of the messages. I hope in the future our hearts don't become as hard as our heads. Which I thought was quite nice. artist plays a crucial role in really touching the emotional nerves of the public. Scientists can talk about facts and figures, but imagery can be so much more powerful in that respect. Musa, just named by Forbes as one of the world's most unique travel destinations, has captured the attention of the Nautical Association. Now suddenly, who exactly controls the museum has become a topic of interest. When these projects start, everyone's very doubtful and, and no one wants to invest a, a big amount of time or money. But as soon as something becomes very successful, uh, which the museum has become, it, it, it becomes the opposite and everybody wants to be a friend. Basically, there was a meeting with the Nautical Association of Cancun. And at the moment, we need to institutionalize the museum in order to obtain funds and to help gain a structure for the museum. There's a misconception by far that the museum is Roberto Diaz museum. It is not, never has been. I'm leading the project because there was no one else to lead. The work that all of us put in there is free work, is honorary. And I'm willing to do it, but I'm not willing to do it if I get this bullshit that I own it, that it's personal. I haven't done anything wrongly, I've done it with honesty, properly, and very happily. You know, I feel that the museum's been such a success, but at the moment it stands at the point of collapse because of the arguing over the, the basic structure, and, uh, and I feel that the proposal that you put forward just doesn't justify the amount of work that we put into it. Those guys you saw in the meeting are not very happy with the structure that we're proposing. They want to be the main sort of dominant party of that structure, which we're not particularly happy about. As with most of these projects, everyone sees the final result, the sculptures in the water and the fish swimming around when, in fact, the amount of work that's got into the permitting, into the, the bureaucracy, into the relationships with different people uh, is, is immense. With matters left unresolved, Jason takes a break from these burdens to join good friend and underwater photographer Mario Navarro for some night dive magic. I've been working with Jason like a year by now. We met because of a common friend. We went diving someday and we started talking about his work, my work. And then suddenly we were involved doing some things together. I knew his project and as a diver, I think it's a beautiful project. Some of the things I see are incredibly optimistic. I see some of the younger generation and how much more aware they are now, how much more engaged they are with the environment. 
But then I also look at the economic crisis that we're facing and some of the choices that people will make according to that, and I think it looks a lot more gloomy. <laughs> Challenge. I mean, the biggest factor is that we have uh, no sort of steady income from it. You know, it's, uh, we're relying on grants and, and, and sponsorship, um, and that's you know a full-time job trying to obtain all those. It provides a very sort of insecure lifestyle. has grown, kind of got the trust of the people I'm working with here. And I'm a lot more free to do what I want to do. That piece there, I've got another title for it. It doesn't work. It works very good in English, but it doesn't work very good in, in, in uh, American English. Now I wanted to call it. Like, I want to call it what a what a what a banker. 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 Obviously, in English, it's a real, like, what a wanker. <laughs> I don't understand. I want to call that piece, what a banker. Uh-huh. Which is like saying, what a wanker. What a wanker? Yeah. But wanker. what's a wanker? Um, yeah. Son dos, eh? Uh-huh. Thanks. I see the problem with democracy is it runs on a four-year election cycle and the climate is not obviously on that time scale and decisions need to be made for the longer term. This particular angel piece, we're going to be planting Gorgonian fan coral in. And that's a coral that is generally in the wave zone and it's flushed by the current and the wave action and it tends to sieve all the nutrients from the water. But because it has a really big surface area, quite often the waves actually uproot it and it becomes loose and dies. So for this, we're going to look for some of this fan coral that's been uprooted and then plant it into the wings of the angel. Talent, skill and determination hold things together. But unbeknownst to Jason, a much larger problem looms that no one person alone can control. The Yucatan is a plateau of seemingly endless mangroves atop a porous rock called limestone. This limestone makes for a very fractured soil. You won't find any surface rivers or lakes on the 44,000 square miles of peninsula because they exist underground. This is referred to as a karst ecosystem. Scientist Emiliano Monroy Rios knows it well. Well, in general terms, we can say that, well, the rain comes, uh, infiltrates through the carbonate rock, this limestone, dissolves the limestone because the water is acidified by atmospheric CO2, but principally by CO2 in the ground. Mm -hmm. This acidified water carves its way to the ocean through the limestone, and this process has been happening for a long time, and that is the process by which the caves were formed. Through water and rock samples, scientists like Emiliano are able to determine the level of pollutants entering the system. 
there are published results in this area where the groundwater flows comes with a high quantities of nutrients, nitrogen, phosphorus, and bacteria. Because the Yucatan Peninsula is very flat and because it's not extremely wet, especially in the north, that groundwater layer, there's actually a thin layer of fresh water floating on top of seawater that's intruded sideways. So it's very easily overpumped as well as very easily contaminated. It's not a deep aquifer at all. It's a floating surface aquifer. I understand that many hotels and many buildings inject the sewage to a depth of 40 to 50 meters. The problem is they are injecting fresh water sewage to the saline water. So by density difference, this sewage will float and will go to the aquifer where we are taking our water supplies for humans. And from there, it flows out to the ocean with devastating effects. Jason's silent evolution is located just down current from one of the heaviest areas of sewage discharge. Silent evolution, we've had all these big algae blooms, but then a sculpture 50 meters away has had none. One of the main factors that can cause this is polluted water that I didn't conceive of when I started out the project. This weighs heavily on the shoulders of Paul Sanchez Navarro. As director of the Ecological Center in Acumal, he works tirelessly to protect the reefs and the bay that welcome over 800 nesting turtles annually. Originally created as a model for sustainable tourism, the Ecological Center tackles the impact issues head on. The most pressing problem? Dying coral reefs. So most people think that the divers or snorkelers out on the reef standing on the live coral is the cause of the destruction of the reef. And it is a problem, but the biggest problem is the water pollution. The growth from the 1970s to now was just incredible in tourism. And one thing the developers and the government didn't really look at was how are we going to treat all the wastewater of all the tourists that come here. Now the private sector, the hotels, the subdivisions like the golf courses, by law they have to provide their own wastewater treatment. But federal laws allow for and actually say to deep inject your wastewater. So hotels are saying, well, we comply with the law because the water standards really are based on pathogens like E. coli and things like that. So they chlorinate the water or treat it for pathogens and then deep inject it. But there's no treatment for the nutrients like the nitrates and phosphates. And that's really what's killing the coral. Nutrients that are dissolved, we can't see them, we can't smell them, we can't taste them. They won't make us sick. That's what's killing the coral reef. Now the fact is, is that we can drink water out of a sewage treatment plant with nutrient levels that are about a thousand times higher than what kills a reef. Our water quality standards are all oriented towards human health, and they're not oriented towards the health of the environments that receive these waters. And so when people say water is safe to drink from a human health perspective, it can be a thousand times too deadly for a coral reef. The sad fact is that only one-fifth of the wastewater produced in the Yucatan receives treatment at all. Most of it is allowed simply to seep into the ground or is pumped into the water as raw sewage. We tend to focus on the hotels. You could have an all-inclusive that may have 1,500 rooms and is producing a lot of wastewater, but at least is being treated for the pathogens. You have the city of Tulum, which is around 15,000 people, and they don't have a wastewater treatment plant. So there's wastewater for 15,000 people getting into the system. We need to stop that. And that's what we're working on now with the government. It's not easy because you only have a three-year period to get everything done because the local administration at the municipal level is every three years and there's no re-election. So every three years you're getting new politicians. You have to start over to get a treatment plan in place. Um, this area, which is the Riviera Maya and Cancun, also Cozumel, which is across the ocean from here, Playa del Carmen, this area has been growing a lot for the last 20 or 25 years. The coral reefs are seeing a big impact. The coral reefs is our primary line of business. This is what we sell. We sell the ocean, we sell the beaches. The Mesoamerican Reef is what provides us with this incredible destination. It's the basis of our product here. So we're trying to get the hotels to understand it in economic terms and to protect their investment. 
because if the coral reef dies, the beaches erode, hotels are destroyed more by storms, the destination really is not that quality destination, so people will stop coming here. They'll go somewhere else where the ecosystem is in good shape. Coral reefs are an ecosystem that has evolved for extremely nutrient-poor waters, and they survive by recycling their nutrients internally. Once the nutrients build up to a, a high level outside, what happens is that stimulates the growth of weedy algae. Literally, they just proliferate and they smother and kill the corals. That's what we see happening in large parts of Mexico, but not everywhere. We see it downstream or down current of the major hotel areas or urban areas. You don't see it up current. There's a very big difference. The scientific side is more what I understand. That's obviously closer to my heart, and that's what I enjoy. And, and I try to help as much as possible with research um, into the species that we have living on the sculptures or that are growing on the sculptures, and ways, obviously, of how we can improve the quality of the waters around the sculptures. They do become kind of an environmental barometer so that we can detect the quality of the water. I went to Musa yesterday and I was really alarmed by the, the amount of algae, and not just on the sculptures, but also on the surrounding reef and the surrounding rocks. It definitely seems a much tougher environment for a coral reef to survive here than in Grenada. To learn how this problem could be resolved, one must first understand how our wastewater is typically treated. Primary treatment is literally the flush into the septic tank where wastewater filters through a drain field to settle and separate into solids and liquids. Secondary treatment often involves chlorine or an aeration process to kill bacteria, but does nothing to get rid of the nutrients. The solution lies in tertiary water treatment. We have what we call a wastewater garden here, or an artificial wetland, and these were built on the property to be what we call tertiary treatment for the wastewater produced in this area. Basically what happens is after the septic tank, the water is filtered into this chamber bed. Plants pull up the nutrients, and with the gravel and the oxygen that goes through it, the pathogens die, and what comes out is a lot cleaner water that you can then put back into the natural system. Human urine is actually a great fertilizer for plants. You have to dilute it because it's too strong. It breaks down into nitrates and phosphates separately once you let it sit for a while. That's where you have that strong odor because there's a chemical reaction going on, but it's excellent fertilizer for plants. Your urine doesn't have bacteria in it. The bacteria clean out in your body is through the, your solid waste. If you put the solid waste out in the sun for more than 30 minutes, though, that also dies. UV rays will kill the bacteria. The biggest problem that we have is that there's no consciousness from the people around here. A lot of people say, look, I'm not going to invest one single dollar if the authority doesn't require me to. And in the meantime, I'm going to make as much money as I can, and whenever this place collapses, I'm going to pack up my things and go somewhere else. In Cosimo, they have more awareness of environments because they realize that whatever they jump into the ocean is going to come back to them. They are very aware of that, and they protect their environments. <laughs> when we keep Cozumel, our island, clean and healthy, we will have Cosmel nice for many, many years. We don't use for drink or for prepare food, just for cleaning. This system is very good for us. Every year, the Yucatan Peninsula welcomes over 13 million visitors from around the world to visit ancient sites and experience Mayan traditions. But there's no denying that this is the biggest draw. White sand beaches, brought to us by the coral reefs, which not only protect the sand, but are the source of the sand itself. The white sand beaches in the tropics are the grains of calcareous algae, and these are algae that make little limestone plates for their skeleton, and those wash up and make the beach. And they're the good algae, they build the beach. Most major hotels, however, have dead reefs right in front of their beaches, leaving tourists to travel distances to find living coral. 
What goes unrecognized is that in time, the beaches themselves will erode and costly sand restoration projects will simply not be able to keep up. Disappearing almost as quickly as the coral reefs are mangroves that protect the beaches from coastal erosion through the binding together of sediments. This special ecosystem is also the nursery for juvenile fish and lobsters who eventually make their way out to the reefs. But to remain healthy, mangroves require the constant tidal flow of seawater. And when that's cut off, the chain of biological interactions that link them to coral reefs is destroyed, despite mitigation efforts to restore it. We like having choices and presuming that they will always be there. What we demand is what is supplied. But do we really understand the truth behind some of the things we demand? Once we were making commercial dive, and suddenly we began to hear the call of the dolphins, the singing. And we look around, and they, they were there just playing with us underwater. It's just incredible. It's really a nice experience. I don't like to see dolphins in dolphinaries. I hate that. If I can say people something, I could say, don't go to dolphinaries. I know how they suffer being confinated. It's just not right. The cruise ships are what are driving the dolphin industry. Every passenger on a cruise ship is given brochures, they're shown videos, they see big posters that are saying, swim with dolphins, it'll change your life. And $150 a head, you can understand that's probably the most lucrative legal business in the Cancun and Cozumel area. And what's happened in the Caribbean is the cruise ship lines are telling every island where they go, you have to have dolphin pens too. If you don't have the attractions that our guests are demanding, then we won't come to your ports anymore. A number of years ago, I was asked by the divers in Cozumel why they were having algae overgrowing and killing their reef. In Cozumel, there had not been an algae problem, which is very interesting. Cozumel is swept by the strongest currents in the Caribbean, and they keep the water pretty clean. So Cozumel reefs were really astonishingly free of algae when I began diving there. But then after a few years, the divers complained. There was suddenly an algae problem where they'd never seen it before. So I spent hours swimming up and down that area. I was able to follow the algae right to the source, right to the dolphin pens. On the upcurrent side, there were none of the weedy algae, or very few of them. The downcurrent side was just smothered with masses of slimy red sanded bacteria, which is the same thing that is overgrowing the statues at the underwater museum, and the same thing we see around the sewage outfalls in Florida. One dolphin excretes five times as much as one human daily, which nature takes care of in the open ocean, where they can swim up to 25 miles per hour and cover distances as far as the eye can see. Worldwide, we've lost most of the corals. Almost every place we go, there's far more dead coral than there is live coral. There are a few exceptions still, but they're not very many. A report that was just published says the average live coral cover in the Great Barrier Reef is 20%, and it's collapsing so quickly there's going to be 10% in another 10 years, and uh, we'll probably be gone in another 10 years after that. Exactly what's killing the reefs? There are a vast number of different factors killing coral reefs, including things that are purely local, the things people do in the water, stepping on corals, throwing anchors down, dredging, using dynamites and poisons to fish, and so forth. Then there's another suite of activities that are regional, where people do on land, not in the water itself, cutting down the, the forests and letting the soil wash into the sea, not treating their sewage properly and letting the effluents wash into the sea. And then there are global stresses, like global warming. Someone driving a car on the other side of the world puts CO2 into the atmosphere, 
and that'll remain in the atmosphere for 150 years. Once that heat is in the Earth's system, it'll sit in the ocean for a thousand years to mix into the deep sea before we feel the full effect. It's the most difficult conservation problem of all because it really is affected by pretty much everything that everybody is doing everywhere all the time. And just how does Tom rank the problems causing the rapid die-off? Number one, global warming, which we're just seeing the very beginnings of. Two, new diseases that have only been spreading in the last 10 or 20 years and are getting worse and worse all the time. And number three, pollution, caused from high levels of nutrients discharged into the ocean. Mexico is no exception. This happens worldwide. You could cry to look at any of these places today. You know, it's, they're almost all gone. It's very sad to see them. With luck, we found Dr. Sylvia Earle here, a legend in her own right, who has spent her life exploring, studying, and loving the ocean and everything in it. If I could just take you by the hand, each of you, and go back half a century to dive into the ocean that I knew as a child, that's what I wish I could show everyone. I wish I could go there myself. It was such a joy getting to see life in the ocean on their own terms. As human beings, we've not been here that long. Not nearly as long as everything else. But within the last hundred years, particularly the last 50, we've managed to seriously alter the way the planet works. With our powers to find, catch, and market ocean wildlife, we've eliminated 90% of the big fish from the ocean. The large-scale, destructive taking, the industrial scale, just has to stop. It has to if we are to restore health to the ocean. About half the coral reefs globally have either been destroyed or are in a state of sharp decline. In some places, it's more like 80%. In the Gulf of Mexico, in the Caribbean Sea, it's 80%. Now, you can find places that are in great shape. I mean, that's the good news. About half the coral reefs, they're not gone yet. But we have a very limited window of time available to reverse this. And when it passes, there will be no turning back. It's time, now we know, that everything connects. And everything we do to our ocean, our land, our air, will be measured. Nature's calling. Are we listening? We have elementary school coming one day, so Jason decided to mold the ears of several of the kids, and then we make it into silicon mold, which are these, wow. so that they could be poured in cement afterwards to get this. And so we were left with around 30 different pairs of ears, and the name for it is called the listener. Uh, and the idea is that um, he's going to be listening to the reef, so listening to nature. Inside is a hydrophone, which is going to be recording data from the reef. Underwater, there's a huge array of sound from all the different clicks of crabs and crustaceans and lobsters. And there's a team of biologists that are analysing the data from it. And they're trying to see if there are any correlations between reef health and the sounds of the reef. I think my favourite sculpture would have to be this one, which we're still finishing at the moment, with the table and the fish and the hand grenades. I don't know, there's something just different about it. Like, it's not figurative, which is obviously predominantly seen throughout these works, but I don't know, there's something about, something about it that I really like. It's quite simple, but it says a lot at the same time. Stop 
networks have dramatically dwindled around the world in the last 20 years. And unless we really force some sustainable fishing laws very quickly, we'll leave the following generations with not much fish in the ocean. You see, it's what I quite like when you take old buildings like this, where nature's started to reclaim things. It's the same as the sculptures, you know. I put the sculptures in the sea and then they're reclaimed by nature. Yeah, I think in the longer term, I think things will all sort of even out and, and balance themselves. But by sort of any stretch of the imagination, I don't think that's an, an excuse for us not to change our lifestyles or to act upon what we know is, is detrimental. There's greater sort of forces at work in nature than, than our role in the planet. <laughs> On the other side of the point is Punta Nizuc, which is far less affected by the nutrient stream. It is here where the angel will be deployed. Once she's finished, of course. I think Musa, in a way, has been a success. Universidad del Caribe made a study, and some of the preliminary results, it shows that at least 40% of the, the whole time a scuba diver spends in, in one of the galleries, the, the silent evolution, it's there instead of being in the natural formation. But the problem that we are facing now is, is the lack of funds in order to continue with this project. I quite like the angel because it, it obviously the sort of uh, the intention of some of the other sculptures is quite dark. So the, the bombs and the politicians, they're quite negative in some ways. They show sort of the darker side to human nature. So I quite like it to sort of, yeah, there is this hope that does exist and, uh, and she sort of, in a way, celebrates that. I think a lot about whether I'm bringing a child into a better world and I'm really not sure I am. I think I'm being quite privileged in my own lifetime to see some of amazing pristine reefs and amazing places. And I hope that she will get to experience the same. But some days I, I do doubt that. As tourists, what can we do to help? really interested in what's going on and say, how can they help? 
we asked them to go and talk to their manager of the hotel and ask for a tour of the treatment plant and ask them if they're deep injecting. So we're finding if we inform the tourists of what's going on, then they can become a really strong actor in finding the solution and really treating the water. And things have changed so rapidly in the last hundred years since the Industrial Revolution and we're just so much more connected to each other and we need to act like that and bring everything together. Our relationship with nature has become so complicated. We take our turns living our lives here on this planet, working, finding our ways, finding meaning. Can we reverse what we've set in motion? Can we reduce our carbon footprint? Will we accept that this is our only viable choice if this planet is to have a future? I think it would be a huge loss to Mexico in general if it didn't continue this unique attraction here. It's the only place in the world that has anything like this. It has such wonderful potential to expand and to grow and to be unique around the world. Activity has come to a rather unsettling halt. The artists are left to contemplate their immediate futures. It isn't easy finding employment as an artist, but the good work done is imprinted in the souls of their personal lives, and more is sure to follow. Spider leaving me. <laughs> Ooh, Paloma, how are you? <laughs> As the angel leaves the bodega to make her way to the sea, we're reminded of her message of hope that we will face with honesty our proper place as a species on this planet. that our collective efforts will come in time. We have an artist to thank for bringing this so beautifully to our attention.
concerning my own work, I think that the problems facing coral reefs and facing the world's climate is so huge and enormous and insurmountable that really I just try and keep focused on my very small part of that and do the best of my ability to try and make some kind of change, however small it is.